Hello and welcome to South to North, coming to you from Johannesburg in the Global South. A diamond is forever, claims the marketing. And yes, this precious stone has come to signify eternal, sparkling romance. But diamonds also have a very dark side. As a commodity that warlords and dictators exchange for weapons fueling civil wars and resulting in human rights abuses. So to what extent is today's mainstream diamond industry free of conflict diamonds? And if you happen to have a diamond glittering on your finger, might it have a blood-stained past? To try and stop this illegal trade, diamond companies, governments and NGOs introduced in 2003 what is known as the Kimberley Process, a certification system that stops conflict diamonds from entering the legitimate supply chain. It means only rough diamonds with a government-issued certificate can be imported and exported. The industry says this has greatly reduced the volume of blood diamonds being traded, but admits the issuing of certificates in some countries is not ideal. Today we have with us Rafael Marquez, author of Blood Diamonds, Torture and Corruption in Angola. We also have Dr. Ola Bello, a resource governance expert at the South African Institute of International Relations. And of course, Farai Magu, a specialist in natural resource governance from Zimbabwe. Welcome, gentlemen. Thank you for joining us on South to North. Thank you. Let's start with the definitions. What is a conflict diamond? What is a blood diamond? It's essentially defined as those diamonds harvested by rebel groups to fuel conflicts. Mm -hmm. And that, that's what is problematic about the narrow definition of uh, conflict diamonds, blood diamonds. Mm -hmm. And do they work alone? Are there other people at the receiving end of it? I think this is the question that the Kimberley process needs to address going forward. I think it's fairly clear to everyone that it's not just um, rebels that are capable of handling um, conflict gems, as it were. Um, in context, um, across Africa, you've seen situations where governments have been um, culpable, I mean, massive violation of human rights, an area where diamonds have been produced. Are conflict diamonds cheaper than any other diamonds? Yeah, they're very cheap uh, because they are traded secretly. Normally, they benefit a few people who use illicit means to export them. So they are not subjected to normal level of taxation. Rafael, let's talk about your country, Angola. One million lives lost in the civil war, gross human rights violations. Was the illicit diamond trade or industry directly involved in fueling this conflict? To a certain extent, it was uh, during the, the war. But the reality is that after the war ended, the human rights abuses increased in the diamond areas. Mm -hmm. And that was solely because the diamond industry is controlled by Angolan generals, uh, by the presidential family, and some other individuals who have used the same methods during the war and increased them uh, to ensure that those diamonds ended up being for the sole benefit of a few individuals. The process of buying diamonds was centralized in such a way and legitimized by the Kimberley process and the United Nations that the president's daughter took 25% mm -hmm. of that business enterprise. And that's what is wrong with the diamond industry in Angola. And that's what I have been uh, writing about for nearly 20 years. It's quite, it's quite a tragic irony, isn't it, that in peace times there are more abuses and the Kimberley process that you're speaking about that is meant to clean up the mess, as it were, or correct the wrongs. You are saying it has inadvertently enabled uh, uh, the president and those who are guilty of this abuse to prosper. But that's why Angola was one of the countries that campaigned the most for the Kimberley process because it needed an international cover you know, for the diamonds to be at the service, to be for the use of the ruling elite. And the diamonds were exchanged by the government as well for weapons, uh, for uh, intelligence, and for other purposes that were not to the benefit of the majority of Angolans. Afarai, you covered the diamond trade in the Maranga area in Zimbabwe, the biggest diamond producing uh, area in the world. Were diamonds from that particular area fueling conflict as well? Yeah, to some extent. Uh, and when you look at this conflict, you look at it at various levels. Uh, one, at the very local level, you see the conflict between the diamond mining companies and the community. You see, conflict between the mining activities and the environment. At the national level also, you see uh, conflict like 
we had a coalition government where some members of the government were accusing others of not remitting diamond revenues to Treasury. You also see a regional conflict whereby you have got the bigger chunk uh, of the illicitly acquired diamonds from Zimbabwe trading in Mozambique. And uh, I think it was in 2011 where Zimbabwe's mines minister accused Mozambique and Zambia of making hundreds of millions of dollars out of illicitly acquired diamonds from, from Zimbabwe. So there were a lot of signs and of conflict even within the Kimberley process itself. Some were saying Zimbabwe diamonds should not be traded on the international market. Others were saying they should be allowed on the international market. So whilst, of course, that does not qualify under the traditional definition of conflict diamonds, you see that there were a lot of innuendos of conflict in, in the diamonds. Do you also not have confidence in the Kimberley process as a response to the problems that you've highlighted? Has it responded adequately? Not really. Uh, I think the Kimberley process, yes, they have tried, but uh, a lot of things have been left unattended. For example, when the KP says human rights is not part of its mandate, we begin to ask, so why were you formed in the first place? So we feel that um, there is no connection between what the Kimberley process is monitoring and what the ordinary Zimbabwean people are expecting from the Kimberley process. We've spoken about Angola, we've spoken about Zimbabwe, but are there other regions in the world where diamonds can be referred to as blood diamonds? The African context, the one that's often talked about, you're familiar with the situation in Sierra Leone and Liberia um, in the early 1990s. Um, if you look at a country like the Democratic Republic of, of the Congo, I think that's also presented Make no mistake about it, it's not a uniquely African problem. We've seen situations like Venezuela, a country that um, voluntarily absented itself from the Kimberley um, certification process, and there are questions still today as to where um, diamonds being mined in Venezuela go. So the Kimberley certification process was backed by the United Nations, by civil society, NGOs, but let's just define it. What is the Kimberley process and what were, what, what were its aims? I think the best way to, to see the Kimberley um, process is to see it um, as an aspirational framework. I think we, what we have here is a very polarizing debate between those on the one hand who take a very deep view of the framework, um, which I think sometimes become um, unnecessarily pessimistic. I'm not a fan um, of um, advocating for throwing the baby out um, with the bath water. I mean, let's um, be frank, um, there have been some positive um, that have been recorded in the 10 years that this process um, has existed. So would you say the process has been effective in curbing blood diamonds? Not completely, but has it uh, gone in the right direction as it were? It's not been perfect. Um, I think one of the achievements you cannot take away from it is the fact that we're sitting here today I'm talking about the Kimberley process as a framework that could potentially be reformed um, to be more fit for purpose. In that sense, I think it's been, um, it's allowed um, some of these necessary dialogues um, to take place. Having said that, I think its functioning has not been perfect. There have been problems people have talked about on many levels. I think the one that consistently dodged the framework is that one about the definition of what um, conflict gem. Mm -hmm. The debate here in Africa is about what's the extractive um, sector going to do mm -hmm. um, to really, really uplift Africans, developmental contribution. And I think these are the questions they need to address rather than just focusing on this narrow question of conflict gems. Rafael, is that what is happening? Has it been ineffective? In the case of Angola, it has been totally ineffective. It has helped to perpetuate a situation of conflict. In one particular case, uh, government soldiers barred 45 miners. And these miners have no protection whatsoever because the Kimberley process establishes a system that should record the transactions from the miner to the recipients in Europe or in America. And that does not happen on the ground because the government purposefully uh, has set up a system of buying diamonds that do not allow for uh, the miners to receive a receipt for what they sell. So that's why they're exploited, they're abused, they're killed, especially when they have valuable diamonds because they're just non-existent for the industry. The Kimberley process in all these years has not made one visit 
to where these gross human rights abuses take place, has not been able to address the fact that to this date, as we're speaking, the government of Angola does not comply with the very basic mandates of the Kimberley process. So does the Kimberley process lack the ability to compel governments to adhere to its provisions? That's what Rafael is saying. I think um, you know, this is the real meat of the issue. And we often talk about the framework um, in a technical sense. Um, but when you look at its functioning and the broader context in which it operates, um, I think there is no doubt about it. It's a deeply um, political framework. So what's the point of having a framework that's not going to be implemented successfully to curb these abuses? I, I, I suppose it's a question of if you are a glass half full or glass half empty person. If you want the framework um, to continue to exist and have at least a fighting chance of helping to address many of the um, critical issues we're discussing here, you have to take cognizance of the fact that somehow the powerful actors within it the state actors, the corporate sector, you need the agreement. I think it's totally naive to think you could reform it without bringing them on board. Very interestingly, uh, Farai, shortly after the Kimberley process declared Zimbabwe's uh, diamonds from Marange conflict-free, an NGO, one of the founders of the KP, Global Witness, withdrew its support. Uh, why was that? I sit in the KP as an observer, together with other civil society organizations, our participation is mainly connected to the communities in which we work. So when the KP declared Zimbabwe's diamonds as conflict-free, it appeared like uh, a lot of issues were ignored, which civil society is passionate about, especially the issue of human rights, though I acknowledge that um, we now have very limited cases of human rights violations in Marange as compared to the past. But what was angering civil society is the assertion by the KP that human rights is not even a KP issue. Mm. So we began to ask ourselves if human rights is not a KP issue, why was the KP formed in the first place? And why did the human rights language form the KP preamble, the KP document? Um, there was also the issue of um, the, the, the lack of interest in, in, in monitoring revenue transparency within the KP. And it was at that point that organizations like Global Witness felt that they don't want to be part of a, a, a talk show. So whatever. basically they're calling for a broader definition of conflict. Yes, um, not conflict. necessarily conflict diamonds, but the mandate of the Kimberley process should be broadened so that communities have got a space. It is too government-centered. Mm -hmm. It is too timid when it's dealing with governments. So, Rafael, would cleaning up the diamond industry in Angola solve the problem or uh, it would entail introducing some punitive measures for those who violate the provisions, including punitive measures against the government and the president? It would be important for the KP to address the reality of Angola. And just recently there was a case in London brought about by an Israeli uh, arms trafficker, Arkady Gaidamak, against his partner, Lev Leviev and it's about Angolan diamonds. They were the ones who set up the system in Angola, and uh, Gaidamak declared in courts in London that essentially it was just uh, these processes were used for their benefit, and they took the diamonds away without even respecting what they had to pay in taxes to Angola, what they had to pay as the share that Angola deserved in the, in the deal, because they were just taking the money away in bulk. And uh, so those are the issues that have always been there and there has been no redress to them. So it's very important that the KP pay attention to what Angolans have been saying because when I look at the situation on the ground, it's not just about addressing poverty. You have cases in the diamond areas where people are not allowed to fish in the rivers because the mining companies say that the rivers belong to the concessions and people have been beaten up, have been abused. But isn't that the responsibility of individual or respective governments to protect the citizens, to get into noble relationships, uh, as it were, with the mining absolutely, companies? Absolutely, absolutely. And that's when, when the governments are the culprits, government officials are the culprits, the, viola the violators such as the army, 
then we have a problem with the definition of the Kimberley process. Why would the Kimberley process then punish rebels? Isn't a rebellion also a problem of the local government? You once referred to the Angolan peace as peace but no bread. Can you explain this? We have a situation of peace in which uh, the presidential family, the generals, take most of the profits from the country. The business opportunities are for them. No business can set up shop in Angola without giving a considerable share to the presidential family Isn't or to the generals. Isn't the president's daughter one of the richest women in the world as well? Absolutely. And we have generals who are also on that, uh, should be on that list because they have so much money. Uh, we have just uh, cases coming out that even the diamonds from Zimbabwe are benefiting a particular Angolan general who has uh, established a partnership with the Chinese and they're just taking diamonds in droves from, uh, from Zimbabwe. There the, are the rumours that uh, diamond from Maranga were used to fund ZANU-PF's election campaign. Is that true? Do you know anything about that? Well, it's good to use the word rumours. Um, yes, <laughs> they are rumours and uh, we have heard them. Uh, we have read in the newspapers, but uh, we don't have evidence to that. So I cannot comment on that in the absence of solid evidence. You want to come in there? The, the issues are fairly clear um, to every one of us. Um, you know, we listen to what people say on every side. And um, you I hear think, those rumors too? Um, you know, not, not specifically on the situation on Zimbabwe itself. I mean, it, it's obviously um, been a very problematic one for the Kimberley process. You know, I see on the one hand um, those within the Kimberley process itself who would not broach any discussion about the need for reform. Um, I think this is incredibly backward looking. Um, it's very short sighted. On the part of civil society, um, I also see a certain level of um, naivety. Rafael? But uh, civil society actors are defending you know, the ground in relation to what they've seen as the reality on the ground. And that's very important to take, for instance, when we look at uh, the Kimberley process, why would it impose sanctions on Zimbabwe? It imposed sanctions on a government. So it started using double standards because on one hand, it clearly stated that conflict diamonds were only those pertaining to the diamonds harvested by rebels. But then it imposed sanctions on a government. In the case of Angola, it refuses even to acknowledge that there is a dire situation of human rights abuses there. So you want them to do, you want the Kimberley process to do in Angola what it has done in other regions like Zimbabwe? Because in Angola, the Kimberley process is used as a cover. To benefit the government and those yes, in power. Yes, and for the abuses to continue. So I don't want the Kimberley process to go there. But what I don't want as well is the Kimberley process to continue to be a legitimate uh, shield for the government. It's almost endorsing the actions of the Yes, government. absolutely. That's and saying. that is what, what is wrong. Because in 2006, I put out a report and there was a reaction from the diamond industry saying that the Kimberley process needed to look into the matter. But they haven't done absolutely anything. So what people do on the ground, which is not naive, is to try to defend the local communities from the abuses they have been facing. Are there ways of, of, of strengthening the KP process or making it more effective, or do we do away with it altogether? We can try to strengthen it. Uh, let me just, uh, again, Angola, for instance, has been chairing the monitoring group on uh, artisanal mining and is the country that most violates the rights of miners. And since 2006, Angola has been heading that group. That's where the Kimberley process comes to a halt because the main culprits are the ones who are at the forefront of the process in some instances. And if that does not change, and Angola now is bidding also for the presidency of the Kimberley process. The and, irony of it. And doesn't even allow proper monitoring from the Kimberley process. Mm -hmm. It's a joke. So what and needs to happen? A dialogue to solve these problems? If or? these problems are not to be solved because of sovereignty issues, then we don't need the Kimberley process. What we need is to address how these governments use sovereignty for good or for wrong. What's the way forward for Ryan? The KP cannot be a replacement for local government systems. When you come down to the real issue, you find that African governments have got very weak 
legislative instruments to govern the, the mining sector. You come to the negotiation of contracts in Africa, it's pathetic. It's the minister who is alone and possibly with one or two friends negotiating with a big delegation coming from, from China or from wherever, which include government ministers, officials from the Reserve Bank, lawyers and the like, and they know what they want. So we need to make sure that when we get into these mining contracts, we know what we want and we negotiate contracts in the best interest of the African people. It's true, we can see evidence of that, that some of the mineral rich countries in Africa are also among the poorest. Exactly, exactly. And it, you, you, we have seen an increase in extraction of natural resources and also a rise in poverty levels. Actually, if you compare the mining communities in Africa and Australia, there is a very interesting contradiction. In Africa, the biggest problem is poverty and starvation. In Australia, the biggest problem is actually obesity. They are overfed, they've got enough of everything. And so we need to address that problem of contract negotiation. And then we go to the issue of value addition. I believe the Kimberley process was also destined to fail because it is only focusing on rough diamonds. But if you look at a rough diamond, it is only 18% of the value of the diamond that has been cut and polished and manufactured into jewelry. So Africa is exporting about 83% of the value of its diamonds to other countries, be it Belgium, India, China, and the like. So we need to make sure that a bigger chunk of diamonds produced in Africa are cut and polished locally. But I just touched on a very important subject, that of contracts and the local legislations, national legislations. In the case of Angola, for instance, it's one of the countries that has a very robust system of signing contracts. And that's why, uh, and very good legislation, even on the diamonds, the government talks about human rights, which the Kimberley process refuses, but it's within the Angolan legislation on diamonds. What happens is that the contracts formulated in Angola include a significant cut for the companies belonging to the generals, the presidential family, and that is corruption, illegal under the Angolan laws. Mm -hmm. And that's what people have been trying to raise because corruption in Angola is very transparent. You know, the Kimberley process is not, some of these discussions, what the UN, the IMF and others are trying to do in Angola is not transparent, but corruption is very transparent because the cuts are there, the contracts are signed with the names of the generals, the presidential family and so forth. Why are we talking about signing good contracts? Because they're there and a significant share must be left in the country. But it's not left in the country in the form of revenues mm -hmm. for the state coffers, but as revenues, profits for the ruling elite. I love diamonds, but I want to be a responsible citizen as well. What should consumers do? I'm not against women buying diamonds. Um, what I'm really for is that people are aware of the realities in which some of these diamonds are harvested so that they can ask the questions and they can help with their consumer awareness. Last word from you, Farai. I think the consumers are a very big uh, part of the diamond uh, value chain. There's something they can do uh, to ask the right questions to those people who supply jewelry to them. Is your, did you get uh, diamonds which are certified by the KP? Did these diamonds not contribute to human rights violations? And this chain of questioning must continue right to the doorstep of the company where the diamonds are coming from so that the companies know that the consumers out there are tired of buying diamonds which are tainted with human blood. Farai Magu, Dr. Ola Bello, and Rafael Marques, thank you very much for joining us, uh, tackling what is clearly a very, very difficult and uh, complex problem. Thanks indeed for joining us on South to North. Thank you. Well, that's it for today. Thank you for watching. Please do tweet your questions, comments, and opinions to at AJ South to North or find us on Facebook. Do join me again next time on South to North. Until then, goodbye.